All right, let's, let's talk about tools. So let's say you need to build a tool to profile or analyze or monitor a large modern program, like a web server or a web browser. A couple of places you could think about building this tool. You could input it inside the compiler. But the problem there is for these modern applications that are very dynamic, you're not going to see most of the program. So I've got a picture here. Uh, this is actually a bias, but web browser and other things they look very similar. In the actual uh, core executable of this program is a tiny part of it. So if you put your tool in the compiler, you're not going to see too much. You can do it in the linker, and uh, you can see even the shared libraries that are statically referred to, you can go and instrument those or something. But you're still not going to see things like plugins. Right? Those aren't defined statically at, at runtime. So you don't know what those are until you're actually running the program. You can try to put your tool in the loader itself. You can see what libraries that are in. But if you want to build tools that are targeting all the code that's run, you're still going to miss things like an app generated code, a JIT, say a JavaScript, or a Java or .NET. So I'm going to talk to you about a, a tool platform that's really targeting these dynamic applications. It's got a funny name, I'll explain later. Uh, I know so it's going to operate at runtime so that you can see everything that's going on. And this will let you build tools that aren't limited to just a portion of the application. All right? So it's going to run on a stock operating system, uh, commodity hardware. It's going to insert itself between the application that you want to target and the underlying platform. So first I'll describe how the system works. I'm going to give you a couple of example tools that we built using this system. At the end, I'll talk about some specifics of uh, how we came up with the source to the history. So if you think about you want to take a running program and go insert some code that's going to uh, gather some information for profiling or it's going to do some monitoring for security purposes, if you think about how you might go about doing that, one thing you can do is go and look at the actual uh, loaded code of the program and go modify it. Stick in a jump to your instrumentation code and then return to the original program. Uh, here we're targeting the Intel architecture, x86, and there's a big problem when you try to do that. You've got variable length instructions. So I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, if you've ever looked at uh, disassembly. These are x86 instructions. You see this? Uh, these are the actual bytes encoding them in the red here. On the left is an address. Since they're variable length, you could insert your jump. If you want to reach uh, somewhere meaningful, you need to stick in this five byte jump, jump it turns out. And you end up clobbering multiple instructions to stick it in there. And you don't really know where all the entry points are. So if there's a jump that targets an instruction in the middle of where you put your jump, you can end up with garbage when it goes in. Right? So it's, it's not really feasible to go stick in these jumps at random places in the program. You really need some kind of Direction. So maybe the first thing you might think of is having an interpreter. Right? So instead of actually running the original program natively, we're just going to emulate everything. Right? We're going to read all the instructions in, uh, keep all, our, all the state and change state ourselves. And this will work fine to build your tool. It's just going to be really slow. Right? So we've got a number down here 300x. That's probably the average for a typical uh, interpreter. Now, there's one insight we can make here that for most tools, most of the code you're running is the same as the original program. Right? So we don't necessarily need to emulate everything. What if we made a copy of all the code? Okay? Then we can run the code natively. And all we do is take all the branches. And we have all the branches come back to our uh, runtime system. Okay? So now we're better off in the software code cache. We can go insert instrumentation in here and put it in the middle of the application instructions. So we've got freedom there because we're, we're building this up. We don't have the restriction of trying to modify the original thing. And if you do something like this, you're still essentially emulating all the branches. Here, you're about a 25x slow down. It's a little better, but it's still kind of slow. So, one thing we can do is here's the original program. Here's say, a function of foo, and the original branch. Together it calls bar, and this uh, dot of line is an indirect branch, it's a term. Okay, 
So we're going to build this dynamically. So we see the path, A, C, D, E, F. Right? And we know that A is going to go to C. So we don't really need to emulate that in a We can put a direct branch over here. Right? So it's only this indirect branch down here between E and F that we really need to emulate to make sure we go to the right place. So putting that in there, now our system is down to about 3x slowdown. So this is more reasonable. This might be good enough for the developer. If you want to build something that could, say, apply to a program in a production environment, this is still too slow. So we can go after this uh, indirect branch overhead. So instead of essentially doing a full context switch to your interpreter, from, from the native machine state of the application to your runtime system. You can have a fast table look. And the indirect branches, they need to target the original application addresses. So the lookup is just going to figure out where the address for F here is located in your cache over here. Right? This is a simple cache table. And that goes a long way for making a beautiful system. That runs about 20% over here. There's one more uh, simple optimization we can do. We know that these uh, branches that we can take here, we can just collapse those and build what we call a trace. Right? So now we've got this sequence of code here uh, that just falls straight through. And we can even go through our indirect branch there by putting a simple compare to see if the target is the same as it was when we built the trace. Right? So this is another temperature. So now we've got this system, 10% overhead. The, essentially, this is a nice sandbox where we can go stick in all kinds of instrumentations. A lot more flexibility in trying to modify the original code. All right, so now we can target a random application and go put in monitoring code or, or what have you. And what we can do is we can take the underlying system that's doing all of this copying of code and uh, branch manipulation make an API on top of that. So that when you go to write a tool, you don't really care about that. All you care about is, OK, there's some code going on. There's some stream of code. And I want to insert some instrumentation, or I want to you know, change the code. Right? So you end up with uh, your tool sitting on top of this platform. And this is an example of the tool that gets some instrumentation between the C and D. Now, a lot of interesting issues here. I'll, I'll talk about one of them, transparency. So we want the tool platform to not change the semantics of the underlying program. Maybe your tool, a particular tool, might want to change something. Maybe it's implementing some translation, or x86 R or something. But the platform, we want the program to run just as it did originally. Because tools that are just doing some monitoring, say in a production environment, they don't want to change anything. So we can't really make any assumptions about what the program is doing. Let's say we wanted to use some registers for our own purposes. Right? You know, the tool is made by some data, it needs some sprite space. We can't just go blindly write to them. Right? The program is compiled to use all the registers. So we have to make sure we're spilling and restoring those. We can't just go stick things on the application stack. Uh, even if uh, you know, we're sticking something beyond the top of the stack, and uh, it's at a point where we're going to pull it back off, once again, there are some applications that will stick things beyond the time of the stack deliberately and then leave them up later. So this violates the ABI and the value convention. But pretty much every convention you can think of is an application that breaks it. Right? And your tool system is going to break that application if you, if you make these kind of so, so this is kind of one of the big uh, drawbacks of doing the software code cache. Now you've got, you're really running everything in a different place and you want to pretend running the original place. And uh, this is where a lot of the work goes in the system like this. And uh, just some examples. I talked about putting data beyond the top of the stack. That happens in uh, Microsoft Office. Right? So it's not some weird application built for us. Uh, you'll see what I'm calling trampolines. This is code that's actually stuck on the stack. Right? You'll actually see that in uh, Unix applications as well. So you can see what the uh, there's some automatic code, uh, things like the mirror. There are things that look like some automatic code, let's say a pack that's executable that unpacks itself at runtime. You've got all these things going on. Uh, 
you have to deal with. And another related problem is not just for uh, the machine resources that your system is using, for libraries. Let's say I write my runtime system to use the C library. Because I'm going back to running the system at arbitrary points in the middle of the application, if I make a runtime system call to a library that the application is itself using, then the application could have been inside that routine and not calling it git. Right? So if the routine is not re-entrant, there's going to be a problem. And re-entrancy is not the same thing as being expressed safe. Right? Many routines are expressed safe these days, but very few are re-entrant. So what we end up doing in our system is we avoid using user libraries at all. We live in a system called like we have a memory, or like MMAP or Linux, or uh, either out of virtual memory, or the corresponding ones are on Windows. And on Linux, it's pretty easy to do. The system call interface is well documented. On Windows, though, the official API that you're supposed to program for is this user library layer called the Win32 API. And you can't really use that for the conflict we need to talk about. So on Windows, we are now in a system call layer using these undocumented interfaces. And uh, this can be a problem. But when a new version of Windows comes out, what they do is they add some new system calls and they <coughs> alphabetize them, right? So all the numbers change. Right? So we have to know what version we're running on and uh, go figure out what all the numbers are. All right, so those are the basics of the system. Uh, the demo here. So this is PowerPoint, regular PowerPoint. It's running under the demo radio system with uh, a little tool that I wrote. All it does is it counts up things like the number of instructions and it stores that into shared memory. And this little application goes and reads that. And you can see, I focus on the three numbers at the bottom. This is what my tool is counting instructions, 20 point instructions, and system points. And you can see it's going up. Uh, if I move the mouse over PowerPoint, right, you can see the launch not happening. Okay. Do they have some timer threads running? So it's often doing things when you're not doing anything. And PowerPoint is a, is a giant application. You know, it's got a whole bunch of threads. Let's see. Uh, it's created a total of 28 over the lifetime, 14 simultaneous. Uh, it's We've seen 470,000 basic blocks. Right? So it's a pretty big application doing lots of weird stuff. Right? With the system, you can write a simple tool and go and analyze very large, complex applications. Let me talk about some larger tools. So, one is in the area of security. I'm going to give you a little uh, background on the security attacks we were targeting. So we're targeting what are called memory-based attacks. So this is where an attacker is going to come in and clobber some stored address, usually, that's in the address space of some target application. And let's you know, say it comes in with a network, it sends some malformed data, the application doesn't properly check the bounds or, or some aspect of the data, and it ends up able to corrupt some piece of memory inside this application. And usually what it does is it tricks the program into running some code that's included in the data that it's sent in. And usually you like to target a privileged application so that you can then make some system calls and something malicious. So you got kind of a couple of steps. You're going to corrupt some data, and then you're going to take over the program cap, get it to run in your malicious code. And there are a number of different types of data you could go after that you can try to corrupt. Most of these are stored addresses or indirect branches. And they're there for a lot of reasons. Uh, you've got return addresses. So x86 is stored on the stack. That's, that's a common thing to try to overwrite. Uh, you can have exception frames. Uh, you can go after the B tables and not storing the language. You know, all of that are stored all over the place. Right? And they're used for legitimate reasons. And they're there for a reason to give you indirection, you can use power. And 